hi there and thank you for joining me. Today we are looking at the Edexcel Foundation GCSE paper that was written originally to be used on the 4th of June 2020 and we're going to look at all the methods and answers. So question one we are asked to write 0.37 as a fraction. So clearly we've been given the number as it is as a decimal. The trick here is to consider where the decimal ends. In other words, the final digit. The column that it's in is what's important. The three is in the tenths column. The seven is in the hundredths column. And that gives us our answer because we can rewrite this as 37 hundredths. If you can simplify the fraction, then do so. In this case, you can't. Question two. Write 29,381 correct to the nearest thousand. Well, saying it out loud helps 29,381. So the thousand column is the nine. We are going to have to round this either up or down. What is important is the next digit. If we use the rule that fives and above round up, this is only a three, so it rounds down. So the number remains at 29,000. Question three, we are being asked to simplify 3e minus e plus 4e. So what we're doing here is collecting like terms. Don't forget if there's an e on its own, it is just one e. So starting at the beginning, we have three e's. We are taking an e away, so that leaves us with two e's. And then we're going to add another four e's on. Two plus four is six e three two one question four write a quarter as a percentage straightforward particularly as this is a calculator paper and to turn a fraction into a percentage well if we take one and divide it by four we get 0 0.25 that is the decimal if we then multiply it by a hundred we get 25 so the answer is 25 percent in question five we're given a list of numbers and we're asked to choose from this list a number that is a cubed number so a cubed number a number that can be found by multiplying a smaller number by itself three times let's do a little bit of work and see if we can find a cubed number here for instance if we were to do one cubed that would be one times one times one so we'd get the answer one that's not on the list two cubed is two times two that's four times two is eight again not on the list three cubed three cubed is three times three which is nine multiplied by three which is 27. therefore the cubed number is the result of multiplying something three times 27 is our answer question six liz is watching a film at the cinema the film started at 14 30 it's 105 minutes long when it ends she takes 20 minutes to get to the bus stop a bus leaves the bus stop at 16 45 and we're asked whether she's going to catch the bus will she get there in time you must show all that you're working that's so you can get all your points so let's have a look at this the film started, so I'm going to do this in some kind of list, I think. The film started at 14.30. Now let's have a look at this film. It's 105 minutes. If we take 60 away from there, 60 minutes is one hour, and that leaves us with another 45 minutes. So 105 minutes is equal to one hour 45. If we have 14.30... If we add an hour, that gets to 15.30, that's half past three. Another 45 minutes would take us to 16.15. So it ends at 16.15. We then have another 20 minutes to add on, which takes us to 16.35. That means she's at the bus stop at 16.35. So yes. And in your own words, she has 10 minutes to 
spare. Okay, question seven. Farhad, George and Tom each did a test. And we've got a little table there to show what marks they scored in the test. George drew this bar chart to show the marks they got. And we're already being told the bar chart is not fully correct. And we have to find two things that are wrong with George's bar chart. Well, let's have a look at a few options. The things that stand out is whilst the scale goes up in nice even numbers from 71, it jumps from 0 to 71. So it's not a linear scale. It has no label. It should say marks scored. Technically, this should say people taking the test. There are no axes drawn. So that could be something else you could comment on. But I think the most obvious one is the fact that in a bar chart, all the bars should be the same width. So Farhad and George having a bar that is one square wide and Tom's being two squared is not correct either. There may be one or two other things wrong with it, but those are the ones that stand out most. Question eight is asking us about our knowledge of angle laws. So 8A, and that's got parts one and two, tells us that ABC is a straight line and we have to work out the angle marked X. And it's asked us to work it out and then give our reason. Actually, you could give the reason first, um, which would show you how you've worked it out. Because the reason is that angles on a straight line add up to 180 degrees. That is an angle law, so that is a perfectly good reason. And of course, that allows us to work it out because this is a straight line. Therefore, the two angles have to add up to 180. So we have 180 minus the 150 that we already know. Therefore, X is 30 degrees. Moving on to part B. And with this diagram, we don't actually have to work anything out. We're already told it's wrong and we need to explain why. So we can once again quote an angle law. This time, angles around a point add up to 360 degrees. So 360 minus 280 equals 80 degrees. So it cannot be a right angle. Question nine also has parts A and B. We'll do them together this time. Part A, we're using a scale at the top, which is showing us how we convert miles into kilometers and vice versa. And part A is saying use the scale to change 40 kilometers to miles. Kilometers along the bottom. Here we have 40, therefore we are looking at this point here. And to the naked eye, it looks to be exactly midway between 20 and 30, therefore it's 25 miles. Then we're given an approximate rule to change from kilometers to miles. And it says divide the distance in kilometers by 10 and then multiply by six. And it says approximate. So we have to use the rule to change 40 kilometers again. So this time we're going to take the 40 we're going to divide it by 10, that equals four. We are then going to take the four and multiply it by six, and we get 24 miles. And in fact, what I hadn't realized at the beginning is there's also a part C, where we're asked to compare the answers of B and A. Well, don't forget, using the scale, we got 25 miles, and using the rule, we got 24 miles. With a question like this, just give a simple comparison. You can say they are very close. You could say that the scale gave us a slightly higher answer or the rule gave us a slightly lower answer. It's only one point. Don't over explain just a simple comparison. Question 10, we're in the world of algebra and part A says solve 3M equals 36. There are a couple of ways of going about this. You can divide and multiply both sides in algebra. I prefer to rearrange to get M isolated. So I'm starting with 3M equals 36. I'm going to take the 3 and I'm going to move it to the other side. Currently, 
it is a multiplier therefore when I move it it becomes a divider so I have m equals 36 divided by 3 so 36 divided by 3 m equals 12 part b I'm going to treat this in a similar way so first of all let's start with 7 minus x equals 3 because it's a minus x I want to get rid of that minus so I'm going to move the x to the other side first so that means I get 7 equals 3 plus x I want the x on its own so for the next thing I'm going to move is the 3 at the moment it's a plus when I take it to the other side it becomes a minus so 7 minus 3 equals x therefore x equals 4 in question 11 we're asked to work out the volume of this cuboid and the way we do that is first of all work out the area at the front so that is 4 times 10 equals 40 that will be centimeters squared but we're going to continue anyway because we then multiply that by the length of the cuboid which is 15 40 times 15 is 600 and because it's volume it's centimeters cubed question 12 Lucy uses a code to open a lock the code is a letter followed by a two digit number the letter is L or U the number is a prime number between 20 and 30 and we have to write out all the possibilities so we need the prime numbers between 20 and 30 useful to know these but if not let's have a look uh, 20 well a prime number cannot be divided by any smaller number equally 20 can be divided by 5 so it's not a prime number 21 that can be divided by 3 so that's not a prime number prime numbers are not even numbers apart from the number 2 so it can't be 22 23 now 23 is not divisible by a smaller whole number so 23 is a prime number 24 is even it can't be 25 is divisible by 5 26 is divisible by 2 27 is divisible by 9 28 is divisible by 2 29 cannot be divided by a smaller number so that's a prime number and 30 is divisible by 2 so we just have two prime numbers 23 and 29 so we have to combine the L and the U with the 23 and the 29 so the code could be L23 and it could be L29 or it could be U23 and U29 those are the four possibilities question 13 a machine fills bags with sweets there are 4275 sweets and we put 28 in each bag the machine fills as many bags as possible and we're asked how many sweets are left now at first sight it looks a very simple question because of course this is a calculated paper so we are looking to divide 4275 by 28 but the fact that we're being asked how many are left means there's a little bit more work to do than you might think so 4275 divided by 28 on a calculator actually gives us 152 point and then there is a long decimal on the end so this long decimal on the end of the answer is the remainder but we don't need it as a decimal we need it as a number of sweets so what do we have we have discovered that by dividing 4275 by 28 we can fill 152 whole bags the decimal is the remaining sweets so we have 152 full bags each of which has got 28 sweets in order to fill all those bags we have used up 4256 of the sweets if we started out with 4275 and we've only used 4256 if we subtract that we find there are 19 sweets not used 
question 14 first of all we have a table it tells us how many goals were scored by three different football teams we're asked to put this information into a pie chart so let's have a look at where we start here we know how many goals each team has scored the first thing we need is the total number of goals so if we add them all up we have 120 goals in total this is important because it means we are going to have to fit 120 into a pie chart which of course has 360 degrees all the way round. It is quite common in an exam question that these two numbers will have a nice easy relationship because if we take 360 and we divide that by the number of goals we find it fits nicely that each goal needs to be represented by three degrees. So to work out the angle for each of the teams 50 goals multiplied by 3 means we need an angle of 150 degrees 45 times 3 is an angle of 135 degrees and 25 times 3 is an angle of 75 degrees and a good check is to add these up and to make sure that they do add up to 360 so 150 285 290 360 degrees so these are the angles that we're going to use on the pie chart we're going to need a protractor so let me fetch mine and I'm going to start by putting the zero on the line that we've already been given with the center of my protractor here right in the very center of the circle so 150 degrees that is down here so I need to make a mark on 150 degrees there 150 degrees let's move that away I need to, to draw a line of 150 degrees so starting from the very center important that you're as accurate as you can be here 150 degrees is just there okay the next team Rovers they have an angle of 135 degrees so once again protractor right in the center or as best as I can make it be as accurate as you can they will give you the odd degree here and there but it needs to be a good diagram I'm now going to put the zero of the protractor as close as I can here to the original line that I've already drawn and then I need to measure from here 135 degrees so 135 is pretty much just there take this away and draw my second line which again needs to be from the center with a ruler to there and that is it as far as completion is concerned because this is going to be city with 150 degrees this is going to be rovers with 135 degrees so the rest of it has got to be united but a good test is to take your protractor for a third time measure this third angle here and make sure that it is 75 degrees so that everything has added up three two one question 15 and we have part a and b a little bit of substitution i think happening here so let's look at part a we're to work out the value of t when x equals 5 and y equals minus 7 so let me just start by writing out the original equation again it's t equals 3x plus 4y let's put the substitutes in then x is equal to 5 so that is 3 times 5 plus 4 and y is minus 7 so 4 times minus 7 now let's not forget bid mass we have to work out the multiples before we do the addition so 3 times 5 is 15 plus let's be careful here it's plus 4 times minus 7 so 4 times 7 is 28 but it's a plus times a minus therefore it's minus so 15 minus 28 gives us the answer of minus 13 part b work out the value of y and we're now given two values for t and x let's rewrite this for a second then 
So t equals 3x plus 4y. But this time we can substitute t. So we've got 38 equals x is 6. So we can put in here 3 times 6. Let's do that straight away. 3 times 6 is 18 plus 4y. We now need to do some rearranging because we need to isolate y. So I'm going to move the 18 across to the other side where it becomes a minus. So I have 38 minus 18 equals, and all that's left on the right hand side is the 4y. So 38 minus 18, that is 20. 20 equals 4y. I am now going to, and you can see it as dividing both sides by 4, but I'm going to move the 4 across to the other side. At the moment, it's a multiplier. If I move it to the other side, it becomes a divide. So 20 divided by 4 equals y. 20 divided by 4 is 5. So 5 equals y, or turn it round, y equals 5. Question 16 tells us that an exam has two papers, paper 1 and paper 2. Paper 1 has 60 marks, paper 2 has 90 marks. The pass mark is two-thirds of the total number of marks. We're then told that Danielle gets 70% of the marks for paper 1. We need to know how many marks from paper 2 must she get in order to pass. Let's get ourselves organised. We know, first of all, that the pass mark is two-thirds of the total number. So the first thing we need is the total number of marks, 60 for paper 1, 90 for paper 2. So we know the total number of marks possible is 150. Now the pass mark is two thirds of the total. So in other words, it's two thirds of 150. So 150 divided by 3 and then multiplied by 2. Divide by the bottom, multiply by the top. So 150 divided by the 3 is 50, and then 50 times 2 is 100. Therefore, Danielle needs in total 100 marks to pass the exam. Paper 1, she gets 70%, so she scores 70% of the 60 marks in the first paper. Loads of different ways to work out 70%. You can divide by 100 and times by 70. You can break 10% and multiply it back up by 7. What I'm going to do, because I've got a calculator, is I'm simply going to take the 60 and I'm going to multiply by 0 0.70. That way, I get the answer 42. That means that Danielle has scored 42 in her first paper. We know that in order to pass the exam, she needs a total of 100 marks. So 100 in total minus the 42 that she's already scored means that she's going to have to score 58 marks in paper two to pass the exam. Question 17, Scott wants to make orange juice. He's going to buy boxes of oranges. There are 24 oranges in each box of orange. 30 oranges make 2 litres of orange juice. Scott needs to buy enough oranges to make 8 litres of orange juice. Work out the number of boxes of oranges that Scott needs to buy. And we've got to show all our working to earn our 3 marks here. Let's start with the number of oranges required to make 2 litres. So if 30 oranges equals two litres, we need to have enough to make eight litres, that is four times as many litres, two times four is eight, so 30 times four would mean we need 120 oranges in total. So if we need 120 and there are 24 in each box that we buy, 120 divided by 24 is exactly five so he needs to buy five boxes in part b of question 17 we're then told scott is also buying some apples and bananas 1260 apples 280 bananas 
and we have to write down the ratio of apples to bananas. Well, let's write down the starting numbers. Apples, he has 1260 and bananas, he has 280. So that is the ratio. So to give the ratio in its simplest form, we can start dividing both sides by the same number. The first thing that would be obvious would be to divide by 10, so you end up with 126 and 28. However, I don't want to break with conventions, but just have a go with a question like this. Try dividing A by B. If you do 1, 2, 6, 0, oh, divided by 280, you actually get the answer 4.5. So the ratio is 4.5 to 1. So it means that apples, there are 4.5 times more apples than there are bananas. And quite often a question like this will give you a relatively straightforward answer. If it was a horrible long decimal, you'd have to go back to simplifying. But now I've got 4.5 to 1. Now that's not my answer. I haven't been asked to take it down to n to 1. I need whole numbers in here. But it is now simply a matter of simply saying, OK, if I double that, I will get 9. And if I double that side, I will get 2. And that is the answer in its simplest form. Again, if you're not comfortable with that, you can literally go 1260 to 280. You can, as I said before, divide by 10. So we now have 126 to 28. Maybe you would divide by 2. So if we divide by 2, we get 63 to 14. I can now see that 63 and 14 are both in the 7 times table. If I divide 63 by 7, I get 9. If I divide 14 by 7, I get 2. It's the same answer, but if you have the confidence, you can just do it slightly quicker. Question 18 has given us this graph with the two shapes, and we are asked to describe fully the single transformation that maps A onto B. Well. If you look at the two triangles, they have clearly one is upside down from the other. There's a rotation going on here. This triangle has been moved around the graph as a rotation. And because it has gone from this quadrant here, round here, and then round again, that must mean it has been rotated 180 degrees. So it is. The first part is correct to say it's a rotation of 180 degrees. We need to know the point of rotation and a straightforward way of finding this is to look at two equivalent points on the triangle. So let's go for the right angle here. The right angle has gone from there to there. If we look at the narrower angle on the point here, that has been turned around from there to there. And at the point where the two lines cross, that is the point of rotation. You could, if you want, try it with the third angle, the one that's furthest away. It should pass through exactly the same point. Therefore, we now know that that rotation has gone through the coordinate minus 1, 0. So that is the full description. It's a 180 degrees rotation through minus 1, 0. Question 19. Adam, Linda and Rytis share an amount of money. Linda gets three times as much money as Rytis gets. Linda gets half as much money as Adam gets. What fraction of the amount of money does Linda get? OK, let's just keep this nice and simple. Let's have a look at this. We've got Linda getting three times as much as Rytis, but she only gets half as much as Adam. So. Rytis is clearly getting the lower amount. So let's say that Rytis is getting one pound. It's the simplest way. Let's just start with a pound. Now, Linda is getting three times as much as Rytis. So Linda is getting three pounds. If Linda only gets half as much as Adam, well, if Linda's getting three and it's only half as much as Adam gets, then Adam is getting six pounds. 
So using this amount, I could have put any number for righties here and worked it out the same way, but this has kept it simple because now I know if righties is getting a pound, Linda's getting three, Adam's getting six, all together there are 10 pounds being shared. I'm asked what fraction of the amount of money does Linda get? Well, she is getting three pounds out of a total of 10. In question 20, we're told that pens and pencils are sold in a shop. We can buy 12 pencils for £1.80. We're then given a ratio. The cost of a pen to the cost of a pencil is 7 to 3, so a pen is more expensive. Work out the cost of 5 pens. Well, first of all, if 12 pencils is £1.80, so £1.80 divided by 12 means that one pencil is 15 pence. That means if we had the ratio of 7 to 3, we would be putting 0.15 in there. That makes it uh, an awkward ratio. So the simple way to do this is to take the 0.15, the 15 pence. Looking at the ratio here, we have a ratio of 3 to 7. So if we divide the 15 pence by 3, that means we get 0.05 and then multiply by the 7, the larger part of the ratio, we get 0 0.35, and that is the cost of one pen. We are asked to find the cost of five pens, so 35 pence times 7 equals £1.75. Question 21a, write 84 as a product of its prime factors. Let's start with a tree with 84 at the top. I need two factors, any two that will do that will multiply together to make 84. I'm going to make life easy for myself. I'm going to say it's 2 and 42. Are either of those two a prime number? Yes, that one. I can go no further with the 2. I need to split the 42 down. Again, I'm going to go easy because I know it's 2 and 21. There may be others, but I'll choose those two. 21, well, 21 is 3 times 7. 3 is a prime number, so is 7. I've therefore come to the end. Now, interestingly, in an exam answer sheet, it says the correct answer is 2 times 2 times 3 times 7, which is correct. That is the correct answer. It also says that an acceptable answer is 2 squared times 3 times 7. Now, in my opinion, that is the better answer. 2 times 2 is 2 squared. But either of these two formats is correct. And in part B, we're asked to find the lowest common multiple of 60 and 84. Well, there is a method which involves finding the prime factors of both these numbers. We've just done 84 in the previous part and working out from there. But let's see if we can just keep this simple. Multiples of 60, well, we've got 60, then 120, 180, 240, 300, 360, 420, 480, 540. I'm going to stop there, see if anything works for us here. Then we've got 84, so 84 times 2 is 168. If we add 84 onto that, we get 252. If we add 84 onto that, we get 336. Another 84 on there is 420. Ah, there we go. We've only had to do four or five multiples, and we have 420 appearing in both lists. Therefore, that is the lowest common multiple. Question 22, and we have a Venn diagram. The universe... The whole box contains the numbers from 1 to 10. A is the even number and B are the factors of 10. And we need to complete this. So let's look at these numbers. Number 1. Is it an even number? No, it can't fit in A. Is it a factor of 10? Yes, it is. So it does fit within B. So that's our first number. Number 2. Is it an even number? Yes, it goes in A. Is it a factor of 10? Yes, 2 times 5 is 10. So it is also in B. So 2 has to go in the area 
where A and B intersect. Number three, is it an even number? No, it's not, it can't fit in A. Is it a factor of 10? No, it's not, it can't fit in B either. So it isn't in either of the circles, but it is within the universe, so it goes in the area here. Number four, is it an even number? Yes, it is. Is it a factor of 10? No, it only fits in circle A, not in B. Five, even number? No, factor of 10? Yes, it goes in circle B. Six, even number? Yes, factor of 10? No, therefore it only fits in A. Number seven, even number? No, factor of 10? No, it has to go outside here. Number eight, even number, yes, factor of 10, no, it's gonna go just in circle A. Number nine, even number, no, factor of 10, no, it's out here. Number 10, even number, yes, factor of 10, yes, of course it is, it goes in the center there. So that's completed the Venn diagram for part A. For part B, it says that we choose a number at random and what is the probability that it is in the set A intersect with B? In other words, what is the probability that it is within the center area here? Well, to work out probability, how many numbers are there all together? There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 numbers. How many of them are in the intersect area? Two of them, so the probability is 2 out of 10 and if you're going to simplify it down it is 1 fifth. Question 23 and first of all can I point out that this question has five marks therefore there is going to be some processing going on here there's also a lot of space being left to answer it so let's start. Carlo puts tins into small boxes and into large boxes there are six tins in each small box there are 20 tins into each large box. He puts a total of 3,000 tins into the boxes so that the number of tins in small boxes to the number of tins in the large boxes has a ratio of two to three. He says less than 30% of the boxes with, uh, filled with tins are large boxes. Is he correct? Right, a lot of information here. First of all, this ratio is about the number of tins, not the boxes, the tins, the number of tins. So if we have small boxes and we have large boxes, the number of tins is in a ratio of two to three. There are 3,000 tins altogether. So we need to put this 3,000 into the ratio. And we do that by saying, right, the ratio has in total five parts. So if we divide the number of tins by the number of parts, we find that each part of the ratio is 600 tins. So we have 600 times two, that is the number of tins in the small boxes, 600 times two is 1,200. And we have 600 times three, three parts, gives us 1,800 tins in the large boxes. So, so far we've worked out how many tins there are in small boxes and how many tins there are in large boxes. The question itself, Carlos is saying that less than 30% of the boxes filled with tins are large. This second part is about boxes, so we need to figure out now how many boxes have been filled with small and with large. So, let's start with small, we know that there are 1,200 tins and we know that they are put six into a box. So 1,200, 1,200 divided by six is 200 boxes. Now large, large we know there are 1,800 tins and they are being put into boxes, 20 each. That means there are 90 large boxes filled. So, back to the question again. Carlos says that 
less than 30% of the boxes filled with tins are large boxes. So altogether, boxes, we have 290 total boxes. We need to know what the large boxes are as a percentage of that. Well, as a fraction, they are 90 over 290, 90 out of 290. If we do that as a division, 90 divided by 290 equals 0 0.31. And in fact, there is a long decimal in there, but I round it to two decimal places. If we times that by 100, we get 31%. Therefore, it is not less than 30%, it is 31%. So is Carlo correct? No, Carlo is not correct. Question 24, we have A and B, but they're very much connected, so we'll do them together. We're asked to complete the table of values for y equals five minus x cubed, and then plot the graph using the figures in the table. So let's have a look at this. We need to work out the value of y for each of the values of x. So let's start with minus two here. So it's going to be y equals five minus, but let's have a look. We have the number minus two. Now, x cubed is a minus, it's minus x cubed. Now, if we take two and cube it, well, two times two times two is eight, but a minus number cubed is always a minus. So in fact, what we have here is five minus minus eight, which becomes five plus eight. So the first answer here is actually 13. Let's have a look at our next value of x. Well, we've been given the minus one, so we need to look at zero. Well, a little bit easier now. We've got five minus x cubed. Well, zero cubed is zero. So our answer, five minus zero is five. Our next value of x is one. Well, one cubed is one, one times one times one. So we have five minus one, which equals four. Our next value for x is two. So we have five minus two cubed is eight. So that's five minus eight. We have minus three. So these are our values of y. Let's plot the coordinates. Minus 2, 13 is here. Minus 1, 6 is here. 0, 5 is here in the center. 1, 4 is here. And 2, minus 3 is down here. What you now need to be doing is joining these up. Now this is nigh on impossible with the software that I've got here because what you need to be doing is drawing a smooth curve and it needs to follow the pattern of the lines. So it needs to be coming up here. And as I say, this is incredibly difficult. I'm sure you can handle it on a piece of paper better than I can, but it needs to be looking something like the pattern that I've drawn there. Don't make it in straight lines, you will lose your marks. It does need to be a curve. Question 25, we have a right angled triangle and we are asked to work out the value of X, one of the sides, answer to one decimal place. So it looks as though we are going to need our good old friend, Sokotoa, S-O-H-C-A-H. T O A. Let's have a look at the triangle. It is right angled, so we're okay there. What do we have? We have an angle. We know the hypotenuse, the long side, that is 178. And the side that we've been asked to find is the one that is opposite the angle. It's the opposite side. We're not using the adjacent side in this question. So we have opposite and we have hypotenuse. Where do they appear in Sokotoa? And the answer is right at the very beginning. So the sine of the angle, so we have sine of 34 is equal to the opposite, 
that's what we're looking for, x divided by 178. If we rearrange that slightly and move the 178 to the other side, rather than being divide, it becomes multiply. So 178 multiplied by the sine of 34 will give us x. And on a calculator, that gives us 99 point, well, it's 99.53, so to one decimal place, because the second decimal place is only a three, we're going to stop at 99.5. And the answer is millimeters. In question 26, we are working with column vectors. We're given two of them. A is three over four, B is five minus two. Find 2a minus 3b as a column vector. Okay, a, we need 2a. All we need to do is multiply the top and the bottom by 2. So that becomes 6, 8. That is 2a. We are then looking to subtract minus 3b. So we are looking for 3b. So 5 times 3 is 15 and 3 times minus 2 is minus 6. So let's work this out. To find 2a minus 3b, we are literally subtracting across. So it's 6 minus 15. That gives us minus 9. And then it's 8 minus minus 6. So once again, we have a minus of a minus. That becomes a plus. So it's 8 plus 6 is 14. So as a column vector, it is minus 9, 14. Moving on to question 27, we have a diagram showing a right angled triangle, ABC, and a quarter circle attached to it. We're told the right angled triangle has angle ABC is 90. Yet yeah, we can see that by the little square. The quarter circle has a center C and radius CB. So in other words, if this was a whole circle, C would be the center. And we need to work out the area of the quarter circle. So the first thing we're going to need is the radius of the circle, the line CB here. Now I'm going to use my own annotation just to simplify things here. I'm going to call the side that we are looking for A. I'm going to call the bottom side of the triangle B and the hypotenuse C. Because I'm going to use Pythagoras here, which says that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But I need to rearrange that because of course it's A squared that I'm looking for. So if we turn this round, C squared minus B squared equals A squared. So what do we have? C squared, that's 9 squared, that is 81. Minus B squared, that's 6 squared, that is 36. And that equals A squared. So A squared is 81 minus 36. It's 45. Now, at this point, to find the length of A, I would find the square root of 45. But let's just hold on a second here. I've got A squared. Now, I'm starting to work with a circle. I'm wanting the area of the quarter circle. Now, to find that, I need pi times the radius squared. And I've already got that. I know what A squared is. It's 45. Don't forget, pi r squared is for a full circle. We only want a quarter of a circle, so we're going to divide that by 4. So that will be 3.142 times the radius squared. We already know that is 45 divided by 4. And that needs to be done on a calculator. And the answer we get, let's go back to the question here, three significant figures. So 35 point the next two digits are three four so they would round down to three so 35.3 meters squared question 28 tells us that each exterior angle of a regular polygon is 15 degrees and we have to work out how many sides this polygon is well quite simply 
any polygon, if you add up the total of all the exterior angles, it will add up to 360. Therefore, to find out how many sides this polygon has got, it's the total 360. Each angle is 15, so if we divide that by 15, we find there are 24 sides. And finally, question 29 asks us to write down the gradient of the line with the equation y equals 2x plus 3. It's a linear equation, and quite simply, the gradient is the multiple of x. So your answer is just there. It's 2. I hope you found this walkthrough useful. Um, if you have, I do have others on the channel. Please subscribe and have a look at those. And uh, I hope you got on great with your exams. Thank you.